I was listening to that introduction. It doesn't sound like a very fun guy, um, but I, I want to make this fun. So I, I, let, let me start with a story. Uh, let, me, let me go off. off uh, uh, my, one of my favorite politicians is Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was the master, the master of a press conference. And at one of the press conferences, someone stopped him and said, President Reagan, how come you only talk about what you want to talk about in the press conferences? He stopped and he said, my wife, Nancy, she's fine. Next question, please. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about what I want to talk about, not necessarily what, what uh, 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 Rabbi Markman asked me uh, to talk about. But uh, my goal tonight, I, I want to be provocative. Okay, I, I want to show you a couple uh, of approaches to solving business problems, to solving life problems that I've gained as a marketing professional and also uh, as some of the things I've done in the Jewish community. Uh, there's a little bit about me. Um, most of it's true. Yeah. Um, I have good papers like a dog. I have pedigrees, but they're just, they're just pieces of paper. It's what you do afterwards. One of the things that I, I, I'm fairly well known for is uh, I was a founder of Blackhawk uh, Marketing. We did not create the gift card. However, we were the first people to take a gift card and put it into a supermarket. And the, uh, um, the business is now uh, generating about $15 billion a year in face value of gift cards sold in supermarkets, drugstores, convenience stores, gas stations. And I, I helped uh, create that business in 2001. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, my nonprofit, uh, uh, Rabbi alluded to it, I'm now the current chair of the Los Angeles Jewish Community Foundation. We have $1.4 billion of assets under management. Last year, we gave away $156 million in grants. I call the meeting to order. That's what I do. All in favor, aye, that's what I do. But we have a lot of money, and my goal is to watch that money and make sure that that money gets out to the community in, in the best way possible. Raise uh, show of hands. How many give to Federation? To the, Federation. the Los Angeles Jewish Federation. Directly to the Federation? To the Federation. Okay, very few. This is not the Federation. This is the foundation, okay? And I make a joke a lot that, that one is like Torah, one is like Talmud. They both begin with a T. They both begin with an F. They're very different organizations. The Federation it does an annual giving each year. They help Jews in need, uh, hunger, housing, health. That's what the Federation does. They raise about $50 million a year. We do more legacy and endowment. Uh, for next generation, uh, larger sums of money. Uh, also, we take appreciated stock. That's what we do at the Community Foundation. We work together. We're uh, same mission, same goal, but we, we operate separately and independently. Okay, enough about that. Uh, another fun story. Uh, a few years ago, uh, I, I met uh, these two Korean-American guys, and we became friendly, and, and I got them the book Startup Nation. Okay, how many people have heard of the book Startup Nation? Read the book Startup Nation? So, the, so these guys invited me to Seoul, Korea. They said, come with us to Seoul, Korea. And I said, I'll tell you what. I will come with you to Seoul, Korea if our next trip is Israel. And they said, Israel? Israel's on our bucket list. We'd love to go to Israel. I said, OK, fine. So I went to Seoul, Korea. Honestly, guy, it was one guy who owns 40 hotels. He picks me up in a, in a Rolls Royce, sh uh, chauffeur driven. And he pulls this book out in the back seat. He said, I read your book, because now it's my book. <laughs> and he's got it underlined in yellow and orange and red, and he's got stickers on every page. He says, this book has been very helpful to me. I said, why? He says, you don't understand how hard it is to do business in Korea. I said, why? He said, we're a small country. We have only 50 million people here. I said, like, like Israel. You're like you're five times bigger than Israel. He says, but you don't understand. We've got this crazy guy across the street in North Korea with, with rockets launched right at us. And I said, so what? We've got five countries all around us, all with rockets aiming right at us. He says, but your people are creative. He says, your people are, know how to innovate. He says, We're, we march in the army. He said, if Japan makes a, a TV, we knock it off. If Japan makes a car, we knock it off. If Apple makes a phone, we knock it off. He says, we don't create anything. He says, we want to go to Israel, and we want to learn. It says in your book, 
He, sa he says, if we go to Israel, can you get us into schools? Said, yeah, I know people. Sure, what kind of schools? You want Technion, Hebrew University? Where do you want to go? He said, no, no, no. We want to go to elementary schools. I said, why do you want to go to elementary schools? He said, it says in your book that Israeli children have more chutzpah. They have more chutzpah. We want to go to the school and watch them when they're teaching the chutzpah class. <laughs> and I'm looking for the camera, because this has got to be like a TikTok joke or something. And the guy's really serious. But I learned in Pirkei Avot, who, who is the wise man? And the wise man is someone who learns from everyone. And I thought to myself, this guy just asked me a really good question. What, what is chutzpah? Where does chutzpah come from? And I'm going to ask everyone here to do something. On a scale of 1 to 10, don't tell me, but think about your own chutzpah. On a scale of 1 to 10, what is your own chutzpah? You got your number? And then I would ask you, what if you were one or two points higher? What would you be doing differently? What, what would you attempt? What would you try? Now, I have three kids, and each one has a different level of chutzpah. So is it innate, or is it something that you teach? Is it, can it be taught? Can it be learned? And then I ask myself, you know, and this happens to me all the time. You know, people, um, people make generalizations about, about ethnic groups. When I, I moved here from Philadelphia, and people said, oh, watch out for the Persians. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah? Well, why is that? Oh, they're, they're, they're tough. Business, oh, my gosh, they're tough. I mean, all my best friends are Persian now. I said, they're like Syrians, but light. If you know the Syrian community, I said, Syrians, a whole nother level. And unless, of course, you happen to know some Russian Jews. A whole nother level. Unless you happen to know some South African Jews. And that's as you happen to know some Israeli. And I said, wait a second. They all have something in common. They all have this amazing chutzpah. Now, growing up 5,000, 10,000 miles away, where does that all come from? And, and that's something I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking a lot about. Is it Torah-based? Because we have this one story where this guy named Abraham talks to God and says, God, you're going you're gonna to destroy Saddam and Gomorrah? But what if I find 50 good people? How about 45? How about 40? How, so wait, wait, we're taught in the Torah that you can handle and negotiate with God? So maybe, maybe that's where the whole idea of chutzpah begins. But our whole Torah is about th doing things that are out of your comfort limit. So that, that's just something I, I, I want to start as a seed and as I start this conversation about where does change come from? Where does innovation come from? I saw the study, there's, uh, there, there's um, 20 billionaires under the age of 35, and 10 are Jewish. I mean, that's just crazy. I mean, we are so disproportionately represented in, ter in terms of uh, innovation, and that's just business success. If you go into the arts and other areas, Jews just, they just reach out of their comfort zone, and that's just something I think about, and I want to just plant that seed. I love this quote by George Bernard Shaw. He says, a reasonable person will adapt themselves to the world. An unreasonable person will persist in trying to change the world to make it to, for themselves. Therefore, all progress is coming from unreasonable people. Jews are unreasonable people. OK. I love this quote also, that the greatest heresy in Judaism is to believe that the world is as the world must be. And I argue, no. That the whole thing is about tikkun olam. It's about repairing the world, changing the world, and changing it for what we want to do. All right, now I'm going to talk about the marketing. So what is marketing? Boiled down, one foot, identifying problems, coming up with hypotheses, advocating solutions to those problems. Got it. First, you have to figure out what your problem is. Here's my very primitive four box square. If you know anything about McKinsey, you know anything about Boston Consultant Group, Everybody's got a four box square. This is my four box square. But I divide the world into two, two groups, users and non-users. I think that's pretty binary. I mean, you either are or you're not. Whether it's a category or a product, you either use it or you don't. OK. And then I ask people, 
what do you like about this product or category, or what do you dislike about this product or category? Okay. Sometime in your career, sometime in your life, someone's going to say, lead a brainstorming. You go, uh, use this chart. I showed it to Rabbi Markman on the back of an envelope in a coffee shop, and that's how I got here. This works. This is my tool. In fact, it's not even a four-quadrant box. There's only three. Because if I ask someone what you like about a product, but you still don't use it, well, then obviously you don't like, like it enough or like the attributes or the benefits of that product. So there's really only three squares. So the first is what users like. The second is what users dislike. And then I save the last box, uh, what non-users dislike. We'll save that one for last. I call that one the holy grail box. So let's start. Oreos. Four billion dollars of Oreos in the United States every year. Four billion dollars. <laughs> they do market research. They use the chart. What do you like about Oreos? And half the people say the filling. So what do they do? They come up with a double stuffed Oreo. Give people more of what they like. <laughs> this ended up taking one third of market share. Okay, we use the word cannibalize. Did it cannibalize the base brand? Yes, it did eat into it a little bit, but it was incremental. We call these line extensions, and the double-stuffed Oreo has been one of the most successful line extensions in the supermarket industry. And you're looking at me and saying, why am I here listening to this guy? This is so obvious. Well, I like the food industry because it moves slowly. Okay? I'm going to show you things that happened 20 years ago, but everybody understands the food industry. It's slow moving, it's obvious, it's what I call high inherent impact. It's obvious and it's simple. So what did they do after this? <laughs> they did a triple stuff. Okay, all right, it works, high return on investment, low failure rate. This is, this is, this is how big companies like Mondelez generate internal rate of return. So I get this job. I'm, I'm doing a, lot, a leverage buyout. I, get, uh, uh, um, I move to Parsippany, New Jersey. They make me the general manager of a very kosher product called Chef Boyardee, which I had to call my rabbi. I said, it's made of pork. I said, what do I do, especially during Passover? And he said, if it's Parnassa, you can spit. So I, I, I learned to taste these products and spit. So what did I do? First thing I did was that I couldn't do a double stuffed ravioli. I did an overstuffed. The lawyers wouldn't let me say double because it wasn't quite double. And this became a home run for Chef Boyardee. And everybody says, wow, you're a genius. I said, well, I don't think so. It's just following this pattern of give people more of what they want. So our number two item in the line was spaghetti and meatballs. So I had this idea. And I, I worked with these other guys. Have you ever made a hamburger on a barbecue? Okay. You start with a hamburger, it's about this big. And by the time it comes off the barbecue, it's about this big. It shrinks, okay. Have you ever made spaghetti? It's the other way around. You start with this much spaghetti, it fills the pot. So I had this idea, what if you take your meatball and right in the middle of the meatball, you put the spaghetti? And I called it jumbo meatballs. And then I get a call from the manufacturing plant. They said, the meatballs are too big, they won't fit in the can. So we had to make, uh, the, this became our jumbo spaghetti and meatball, another home run success. Again, giving people more of what they want. We didn't even have to change the ingredient line on this one because we were using the same ingredients. We just put the pasta inside the meatball. All right, so I'm gave, I've given you uh, two different examples about giving consumers more of what they like. Uh, this is a product that I helped do the initial research for, and then I ended up doing the angel uh, first, second, A, B, C round of, uh, of um, investing uh, from a venture capital standpoint. Barbecue was our number one product. Ask people what they want. I like barbecue. So what did we do? We did it extra hot. Give people more of what they want. I could do this all night long. Okay. I'm ready to move on to the other side. What do users dislike? Okay, let me start with one of the easiest ones. I drink Coca-Cola, but it's got too much calories. So they came out with Diet Coke. What are we doing here? We're finding out what people dislike. 
it's the calories, and to get them to drink more, we, we have a Diet Coke. I would drink more except it's got too much caffeine. So they came out with it caffeine free. So this is the other side, finding what people want and uh, will they use more. There's only two ways to grow a brand. You either get more households to use your product or you get the households to buy it more often. And if you could only drink one Coke a day, but now with caffeine free, you can drink more. That's how we get, uh, uh, again, line extensions, high internal rate of return, high return on investment. The next couple are uh, um, products that I, I, uh, I developed and I'm pretty proud of. Uh, what don't you like about a can of tuna? Well, you got to open it. You got to drain it. So we launched a pouch pack. Okay. Uh, no draining required. No can opener required. And this was uh, a line extension in the tuna industry. And then my personal favorite, and probably will say on my gravestone, Evan is the guy who figured out how to put mayonnaise inside the tuna can. So this is a tuna can. Uh, we call it a kit because it comes with crackers. With this one, just to get a little chemistry, uh, you retort tuna. In other words, it's a, its own little oven. And Bumblebee, uh, we were making one billion cans of tuna a year. And the rule of thumb is if you kill one person, it's too, too many. You don't want to kill people in the food industry. That's the, the first thing. So by you heat the product for six hours, and it has atmospheric pressure. The three variables are time, temperature, and, and atmospheric pressure. I introduced a fourth variable, uh, pH. So if I said to you, well, have you, ever made, have you ever had pineapple? I said, yeah. Canned pineapple? Yeah. Well, it's very acidic. So because it's so acidic, the, the pH kills the bacteria. If you've ever had tomatoes in a can, same thing, tomato sauce, the pH kills the bacteria. So I said, can we acidify the tuna? And they said, yeah, we can put in pickle juice. So we put in a pickle juice, it's actually glucona delta lactone, but anyway. So I made the first ready to eat tuna salad. Uh, over the last 25 years, this has hit the billion dollar mark. So I was pretty proud of that. Uh, um, Bumblebee uh, tuna salad kit. All right, same idea though. Finding ways, that, uh, finding things that people object to, remedying them, and then in increasing your, your purchase frequency. Okay, I'm just recapping here. Uh, giving people more of what they like, that's, users, that's line extensions. Fix what they don't like, product improvement. But how do we move consumers that are non-users to the category, how do we move them over to become users? So here's a case study uh, on a product that I, I worked on. Uh, carrots. I'm going to ask you guys, what do you like about, where's my carrots? Well, I brought a prop. What do we like about carrots? The crunch. Crunch. What else do we like? Healthy. 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 What else? Build up this. <laughs> what else? What do we like about carrots? It helps your vision. It helps with your eyes. They're good for your eyes. I like the the sweet, like the leaves, they're pretty cheap. I mean, I, I, as vegetables. Okay, what don't you like about these carrots? Hey, first, you gotta wash them, then you gotta peel them. What else? Flavor. And the flavor can be a little bland, yeah. or or inconsistent. When they're like cracked, yeah. And they're they're cracked, they're inconsistent, and they're a little gnarly here. Okay, <laughs> so I think you probably are gonna guess where I'm going. Uh, I got everything here. Tastes good, healthy, good for you, inexpensive. Wash and peel them, cut them, and you know they're not everywhere. So I helped uh, work on the Bolt House Farms baby cut carrots. Why do I like this one so much as a case study? Okay. Are they baby carrots? They're baby cut carrots. So what we were doing was we, we take these big ones and then we run them through a lathe. Okay, like. And then we nub them on both ends, and we make them uniform in size. So these are all 16 ounces. They have a UPC code on the back. The grocer thought it was the best thing in the world because the grocer gets them now in cases, and they scan, boom, boom, boom. The grocer's charging 33% more. Grocer's making more money. What did they do with these broken carrots? What did they do with these broken carrots before? 
No, they gave it, they, they shredded them, they made carrot sticks, they fed them to horses, they, they, uh, they put them in the salad bar. So now you're getting almost 100% usage of the carrots. Uh, longer shelf life because of the bag. Uh, they started, to your point, uh, uh, working with the seeds to make a sweeter, better tasting carrot. Uh, year round avail availability. And here's the proof of the pudding. Per capita consumption of carrots went up 4x. Four times the amount of carrots that people eat in the United States went up fourfold. Because now they have them at the San Diego Zoo. They have them at Disneyland. They have them on the airplane. They have them all kinds of places you would never have expected to see carrots before. I say this is a win-win-win because the grower's making more money, the supermarket grocer's making more money, and the consumer must like it because they're buying four times as much. So that's my three legs of the stool. The grower or the manufacturer, the retailer and the consumer. If all three of them are very happy, then you have a success, $1.4 billion. OK, I'm now going to do another one um, that I was intimately involved and in. I told you about this already. This is a gift certificate. Anybody ever seen a paper gift certificate? It's a gift certificate. This is what we used to have before plastic gift cards. All right. A lot of problems with these. First of all, if you steal them, they're like cash. There's no way to inventory them, or it's actually a currency. But most importantly, no way of tracking them. And not the easiest thing to give. And my epiphany came when I went to Bloomingdale's one Hanukkah, and I had to wait an hour and a half to buy a gift card at Bloomingdale's, and said there has to be a better way. So I ended up working with Safeway Supermarkets, which I have to say, um, excels in DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. They found out I was Jewish. We had 250,000 employees. I was in charge of innovation. I had my own parking spot. Uh, and then the announcement came out that on Yom Kippur, they were in honor of the Jews who worked at Safeway, they were going to serve matzo ball soup in the cafeteria. <laughs> I was flattered. I wasn't there, but I was flattered. And I didn't want to explain to them that matzah is best, but OK. So I went to work for, I went to work for, uh, for Safeway. Uh, Safeway was our supermarket. Uh, that was the last one. Uh, uh, gift certificates. Uh, what do you like about gift certificates? Uh, easy they're easy to give. They, they don't go bad. Easy to launder money with them. Yeah, great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's the paper gift certificate. And then we launched the, the this is actually funny. The, the people who started, the innovators in the gift card business, plastic gift cards, the migration from a paper gift certificate to a plastic gift card was a company called Kmart, surprisingly. Warehouse Music, a blessed memory. KB Toys, a blessed memory. Borders Books blessed memory, of all of these companies were the innovators and they had their own plastic gift cards. Our innovation was putting them in the supermarket. And then we created the, uh, what I called the gift card mall. And I made the initial calls to, uh, I called Blake Nordstrom, and I pitched him on the idea of having a Nordstrom's gift card inside a supermarket. And I'll never forget what, what Blake Nordstrom said. He goes, you, you want to put my gift card next to the bananas? <laughs> I said, how is that good for my brand? <laughs> well, the, the, the first year we did about $100 million in, in his gift card sales. I never heard him complain again. <laughs> uh, but I, uh, that's the ultimate, uh, we used to call that the uh, uh, aircraft carrier. Those were the, the larger end caps. But when I was first pitching this, I would go into the supermarket and, and the, the, the store managers would fight me tooth and nail. And I'd say, look, I need this much space. And I said, I can generate $10,000 in profit in just this, this, this amount of space. Gift cards don't go bad. They don't spoil. We don't have to inventory them. I brought in my own labor. We set up the gift cards. So there was no inventory. And then, the la and then to scan them, they go right across the register. Uh, I use the same rail. We call the same rail as uh, you probably don't remember phone cards. Uh, but also a Visa card. So we use the same rail. So a, a gift card, if you go into a supermarket and steal one, doesn't work. 
because it, it, again, it's like a light switch. You turn them, you have to activate it and turn it on. So, so we, we built it so that the gift cards could all, had to be activated when they scanned and we were keeping about 7% of the sales. So it was a good business. And especially around uh, holiday, the month of December, we did about 40% of our business in about a three week period. Uh, next thing you know, we had 250 uh, gift card partners. Uh, no surprise, Apple and Amazon are, are some of the biggest ones. They didn't want to pay 7%, but that's, we, we worked that out. Uh, but this became uh, ubiquitous. I would say it's in every retail store. Uh, we got into Home Depot and Lowe's, and uh, um, they fought me every which way. They, they told me that restaurants were going to take sales away from supermarkets. Um, I, I don't believe that. Uh, uh, this, just became, this just became a very, very large uh, business. Uh, we ultimately spun it off, uh, created a separate subsidiary. Goldman Sachs took us public. Uh, a few years later, a uh, private equity firm bought it, and now it's private again. Um, but it fits my model of the consumer's happy because you created convenience. How much do you pay? I'm going to call on you, Mr. Grunman. How much do you pay for a $100 Nordstrom card at the supermarket? $100. So that's a deal. There's no premium. There's no upside. Um, the other cards, the Visa cards, the American Express, those you do pay a premium for um, because those are essentially open loop. Uh, they're like cash. Uh, but for the gift cards, uh, we call those closed loop because you can only use a, a, a Bloomingdale's at Bloomingdale's, only use a Nordstrom's at Nordstrom's. Uh, those we were getting up to 7%. So the supermarket, the retailer was happy. The issuer was happy. The Bloomingdale's, the Nordstrom's, the Macy's, the Sears, the Kmart and the consumer's happy. So again, there's my, there's my model. I'm almost there. Um, uh, I'll do questions at the end if I can just, okay. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell talks a lot about the, uh, the tipping point, that these ideas spread like viruses. Uh, Seth Godin, who uh, actually acknowledged me in my, his first book, and just like Aish, he also spelled my name wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> for, uh, he says, um, people will talk about things that they like and create a virus, and, and they'll spread the word. Uh, but you really have to uh, break out. Uh, you're thinking, okay, so what's it have to do with me? So again, I like to use the food industry because it's great for slow case studies. You get to see the, the main ideas. But you're thinking, how does this apply to technology? How does it apply to today? What can I do with these ideas now? If I'm not in the food business, how does this apply to things that I am doing? And here's just a couple, uh, just how fast we've come in terms of uh, rapid uh, uh, spreading of, of new ideas. It took 40 years before 10 million people had a radio. It took 15 years before 10 million people had a television. Uh, I like the Pokemon one. Uh, Pokemon had 500 million downloads in 30 days. Uh, what did I read for ChatGPT? Uh, they hit 100 million uh, downloads in, in, in 30 days. And, and my, my new favorite is uh, 72 million people watch the Donald Trump interview the next day. Uh, when he, uh, 72 million people overnight. So the world is much faster, uh, which is why I like the food industry. Uh, your world is much faster. Things happen so quickly, but I, I would argue that the principles stay the same. I'm done. Uh, I, I usually quote, especially when I'm in Aish, I usually uh, close with a Mother Teresa quote. And she, she said, we can do no great things in the world, only small things with great love. Uh, I'd encourage everybody to think about where your passions are and then to work, work in developing ideas uh, where you have your passion. And then uh, I like Willy Wonka. He says, so shine a good deed in a weary world. So that's really all I had to say. Uh, I didn't want to get in the way of too much of the social time. Um, I did see a question, so I will try a question. And then if you want me to talk more, I will. But um, let, me, let me do the questions first. We were keeping 7%. What is it? We were keeping 7%. How, how, how were you keeping 7%? Because we, we would negotiate with the retailer and said, do you want to be in our program? Uh, we're going to drive sales. The retailer now, or the manufacturer? Uh, the retailer. Oh. The well, retailer. If someone put $100 in a gift card? They get $100. They get $100. Uh, we would keep 7 and Nordstrom would keep uh, 93 What you probably already know is that not everybody uses every dollar on their gift card. 
Uh, I still have the ones from my wedding. They're sitting in a sock drawer. So, so uh, we, we, we call that escheatment. Those are uh, um, cards that were not used. Or you had a $100 gift card at Nordstrom's, and now you have $2.23 left. And you say, what am I going to buy for $2.23? You throw the card away. Uh, so lost cards, unused cards, uh, uh, the remainder cards. And then there's some lost stuff about decrementing in the state of Delaware, and, but I won't bore you with that. But um, that, the, uh, and then what I would ar actually argue is that there's an upsell. So imagine I sold you a $25 uh, gift, uh, gift card to, I don't know, Pat's. You see how I picked Pat's, not TGI Friday, right? So, so, so I said $25. You can't spend $25 in a restaurant. You can't, and it's not good on alcohol and tips anyway. So they're driving traffic to the restaurant. You're going to go with a friend. You're going to order more than $25. So there's an, uh, uh, an, up, an up spend, uh, and that we can prove. And more importantly than anything else, you can track the cards. You, you know when they're sold, you know when they're redeemed. Uh, if, you want to see a, if you want a proof point, go to Costco. They're selling them for 80 cents. You go and get a CP. Did I say CPK? CPK? I didn't say CPK. The, uh, coffee bean. They, ha they have coffee bean gift cards uh, at Costco, and they're selling them for, for uh, you can get four $25 cards for $80. Why would they discount so much? Well, because they're driving traffic, and they're driving for the overspend. And the nice thing about the way the business is now, we know every transaction. We know every transaction uh, by time, by date. And uh, one of the other things we had at Safeway is, we had uh, 24 million people who gave us their phone numbers so that they could get discounts at, at a Vons or a Ralph's. The first, they ask you, what's your phone number? Well, we're, we're, we're capturing that data. I, I, know, I know everything you've bought for the last two years, every magazine you bought. I know, I, I know er, every, everything that you bought. I know on Friday nights, um, you know, we had two things, well, I shouldn't say this. <laughs> okay, two things spike on Friday night, condoms and diapers. So those are the two things that, 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 that so, so, so super mar supermarket people track everything that you're doing. And we know who's buying gift cards, we know by store, we know by time, we know by, uh, so they, they track your data. Ooh, that's a great question. Um, is there a formula that I use for investing in, in businesses? <sighs> People first, uh, and that's the soft one. Uh, um, the, the classic ones, if you read the books, uh, addressable market, how big is the market, uh, barriers to entry, uh, whether it's uh, intellectual property uh, or what they call moats. Um, I look for proof. Uh, does the dog eat the dog food? How do I know that? The, uh, and then I particularly like high margin businesses. I, I like businesses that have high margin. Uh, software now, but could be software, could be SaaS companies that have, that have high margins. Um, Makeup is high margin? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it, it is the least scientific answer I could give you. Uh, people come first, and I have, my track record is not so great. Um, I, I probably missed more than more than, than most. Had, had a couple wins, um, and maybe maybe that is just the way it works. But uh, uh, I'm not as technologically savvy as my own kids, uh, who are programming in VR and doing things that I, I can't even imagine. Um, so I tend to stay to the low tech businesses, and the low tech businesses uh, are a little easier to analyze. Um, that, but the high tech are where you see the uh, the uh, crazy returns. So, what did you do like the first five years of your career after getting out of the So I went to work for uh, I, a couple a couple stories. Um, um, my father told me that I wasn't smart enough to major in accounting. So I had to prove to my father that I could um, get a degree in accounting. I thought that accounting was the language of business. I thought if you were going to go to France, you'd learn to speak French. If you're going to business, you should learn accounting. I'm not sure if that was a good use of my time, um, but I also had a marketing degree, and then I had a lot of loans. So I went, I went to a very large company. I went to, it used to be called General Foods, and then became Kraft, and then now it's Mondelez. Why? Because they had these huge brands. They put me on Kool-Aid, okay? Kool-Aid had $500 million in revenue, 
and a, we spent $100 million in advertising. We spent like $20 million in, in research and promotions. And, and I thought, wow, look how much I'm going to learn here because of all the data. And we launched uh, NutraSweet. We launched aspartame and NutraSweet a year before Coke Sorry. and Pepsi. And that, that to me was, was so exciting. Uh, and then f uh, <laughs> I became very friendly with two of the senior managers. They went over to Entimans. So I went over to the Entimans group with them, and I got to meet Mr. William Entiman. And we developed the first fat-free uh, bakery product. Uh, and how did we do that? Why, did, why does fat taste good? Because it's got moisture. So we were able to bind water uh, we were able to, by using vegetable gums. And that's how we took the fat out of the, uh, uh, the product. We put, in, we put in sugar, but, but it was fat-free. And I got to launch the first fat-free bakery product in the United States. Wow. Then they asked me to launch something called Bobily which was also a lot of fun. And then uh, I went to work for Oro Wheat, and uh, we had uh, oat nut bread and health nut bread and all the, the varietal breads. And I just wanted to be where they were spending money. I wanted to, I wanted to be where they had big budgets and lots, lots, of, lots of money, and they weren't watching the pennies, nickels, and dimes. I learned some bad habits because big companies, they squash innovation, uh, they, they, and they're torturous to work for. And they, they wanted me to give a keynote speak on Yom Kippur. And, I, and, and it was a real big dilemma for me. And I, I said, Sandy Koufax didn't pitch on Yom Kippur. Evan Schlesinger is not speaking on Yom Kippur. And they told me, Tom Perlstein's coming. I said, well, good for Tom Perlstein. But, uh, uh, so big, big companies are, I, I used to work for Pillsbury also. And, uh, I, I, I was developing packaging for them. And we were putting a, an OU on there. And they asked me, what's with this OU thing? I said, well, that's a kosher symbol, and it stands for the uh, uh, Orthodox Union is certifying that this product's kosher. And the guy says, well, what does that mean? I said, well, there's three categories of kosher. There's kosher animals. Pigs are not. Cows and chickens are. You can't eat meat and milk together, so that's another type of kosher. And how you slaughter the animal. It has to be uh, ritually slaughtered in a certain way. The guy looks at me and goes, Boy, you know a lot about this stuff. I said, yeah, where I grew up, a lot of my best friends were Jewish. <laughs> I, I, I met a guy in the elevator. His name was David Levy. I said, psst, psst. I said, you Jewish? He goes, yeah, of course. I said, I said I'm, I'm, I'm in Minneapolis. Where do you, are you, are you going anywhere for Rosh Hashanah? He said, no, I'm by myself. I said, can I join you? And I, I, met, a, I met a guy in an elevator. I mean, that's how few Jews there were in these big corporations. Um, but I, I did okay. I did okay. But they weren't exactly, they weren't exactly Jew friendly. <laughs> but it worked out. It worked out. So I would argue that you do a little bit beyond market research. I would say that there's definitely some deep insights that you had in each of these categories. What would you attribute that success to? Do you have any tips, tricks? On my website, um, and I, I did, I left the big companies. Uh, I didn't get married till I was 39. Uh, I had my daughter when I was 43. I had my twins when I was 48. Don't follow that, <laughs> that, that part of, of, of my program. I, was, I waited too long, but I was too busy. I was traveling. I was on the road. But when I, came, when I finally decided to settle in LA, uh, I started a market research business. And on my website, I wrote, God gave us two ears and one mouth, we should use it in that proportion. And if you ask for my one key success, listen. Listen to the consumer. Listen to the consumer. The consumer is always right. And when you're working with supermarket store managers, well, listen. They're always right. And when you're listening to the bankers, listen. They're always right. And if you're married, they're, I'll leave that one alone. Um, listening. It's, it, it, it's, it's again, um, Le learning. It's, it's, it's a humility. It's, if you think you know, you're, you're probably wrong. And if, if you have a hypothesis, then really what marketing is validating that hypothesis. And you have to, it's good to have a lot of hy hypothesis. It's good to brainstorm. It's good. But, but in, in the end, you, the best ideas come from other people uh, or by accident. So, so even what you have as a hypothesis may or may not um, What's the prayer in the morning in, uh, that you say, God, God creates all things? Oh, at the beginning of uh, creation. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right, you're going to look it up. So, all right. Yeah, so just being op open, just keeping an op op open mind. You know, I'm sure you've heard that old quote. In 1890, the head of the patent office said that he wanted to close the patent office because everything that could have been invented already was. I call that closed minded. What year was that? 1890. He said everything that could be invented has already been invented. So the, there's more closed, I think closed mindedness is, is what kills creativity. Being, being open minded, you know, you know the famous story of the Polaroid camera. Uh, the uh, uh, Edward Lamb uh, was taking photographs at his daughter's birthday party, and she said, I don't want to wait for the pictures to be developed. I want them now. Why can't I have the pictures now? And Edward Lamb said, that's a great question. And he actually developed a film that developed uh, within 60 seconds, and that's how the Polaroid uh, was developed, because his daughter said, why can't I have it now? So that's keeping it, uh, uh, most people would say, because you can't. And he said, well, maybe you can. So just keep, keeping that open-mindedness uh, that, that um, uh, what's that Heschel quote? Uh, 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 radical amazement. Uh, just to always be curious and al always to have radical amazement. Yeah. Um, I have a question about how you were able to motivate and get the buy-in of these big corporations. There's a book by Clay Christensen called The Innovator's Dilemma. And a lot of major corporations, they focus so much on their current market segment that, and they don't really do too much with new segments and the, and the new markets. Um, anyways, I'm just curious because you would be at this big corporation convince them to, to take some risks. How was it getting their buy-in? What was the key to that? Uh, so I, I, I would an start by answering it this way. If you're an accountant, I would recommend that you work for an accounting firm. Because if you went to work for the supermarket, you, you're just the accounting guy. If, if you're a software engineer, then you work for a software company. Again, not the supermarket. But because I was a marketing guy working in a marketing corporation, they were looking for marketing innovation. So they weren't fighting me as much. They were still resistant. Uh, and you know, we have a lot of sayings in, in new products, you don't know what you don't know. Um, so, so I have some uh, mantras, uh, fail quickly, fail cheaply. Because the, the faster and, uh, that you, you fail, the, the more likely you can tweak and, and come back. Uh, um, never be surprised in a meeting. Uh, always do your homework in between the meetings. Try to get your buy-in between, between the meetings. Uh, so that by the, uh, you ever seen those bobbleheads you know, you, that they sell at the baseball game? When you go to a corporate meeting, you want everybody's head going like this. As soon as someone goes like this, side to side, you're toast. It, it's over. So I would try to get as much alignment prior to the, 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 the meetings, especially the ones where I needed funding. Um, but it, uh, people are resistant to change. Even though they say they want it, uh, they're resistant to change. Jack? All right, so, so let me play with one, because I did, I did this one uh, the last time I gave this. Uh, I did it f uh, f uh, with the Federation folks, and I, I got into a little trouble, but that's okay. Uh, so instead of food, what if I said, what do you like about the LA Jewish Federation? They help Jews. They help Jews. Good. What else do you like about... It's this community. For the they, they, people come in. What else do you like about the LA Jewish Federation? They uh, under, like, they support a lot of other like. They uh, support organizations. They support a lot of other organizations. Yeah. Okay. What do you not like about the federation? They don't integrate minorities as well as they advocate. Well I, I can't hear. They don't. Uh, They haven't. They haven't done a good job uh, at being inclusive. OK, thank you. What else? What else do you not like about Federation? Uh, one of the ones I hear all the time is, I don't know where my money's going. It's gone to a big black box. Another one I hear is, I want to control the money. I want to give to who I want to give the money to. I don't want to. Yeah, you can't 
can't direct the dollars. Can't you're... direct the dollar. Yeah. Like, like, why do I have to give it to? A, 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 I don't need an agent. I don't need a, a middleman to on my on my sedaka. I give this who I want to give to. What else do you not like about? They're vague. Their structure, like this is very, we know exactly it's at Maury's Fireplace. The group has, I guess, I don't know, 60 to 100 people. Um, just, the Jewish Federation just seems kind of, even though I've been here for a decade, it still seems kind of vague to me. Mm -hmm. they, they can't articulate who and what they are and what their vision and mission is. That's, that's, that's a problem. They, they have a lot of staff. They have expenses. They have overhead. So I, I use this exercise in, in a Federation workshop. And it got a little controversial, but, <laughs> but, but the, the, the point, the, the same philosophy of find out what people like, give them more of what they do like. What, what do I, and just to go on record, uh, if I moved to a city where there was no federation, I would start a federation. But because I'm in a city that has a federation, I'm going to complain about the federation because that, that's how it works. So, so, so I encourage you all to think about that. What, what do they do well, and what could they do more of? I like the social. I, I love this. I, just, I like the social part of getting people together, about identifying problems that, that you want to work on together uh, to, to, to solving problems. And I agree with everything you said about the things that they need to work on, uh, articulating their mission, communicating uh, what, what they're doing, uh, being more inclusive, uh, reducing overhead and expenses, and, and, and I would use this for, I'd use this exercise when, when, I, when we go on a family vacation. I said, all right, what worked? What did you like? What did you want more? What oh, didn't like work? What? Like a retro? Yeah, I do that. I just like, what, what worked? What didn't work? So anyway, I don't want to get into the way of the social because uh, um, I, I used to go to something like this when I was in New York. Um, and uh, Esther, Ra the Reverend uh, uh, Rabbi Yundrin used to do a Parsha. And then at the end, She'd say, look, you didn't come here to hear me talk. He said, what's the first mitzvah in the Torah? Is Peru or Vu? So go be fruitful and multiply. I'm, I'll be here, but this is a social thing, so go, go be social. But thank you for having me. Um, and I do take feedback, both positive and, and negative. Uh, so thank you for having me.